the fundamental assumptions of Western civilization are valid. There has to be a, a hierarchy of quality, and not only so that we know who the best are and can reward them properly, but so that we can reward them so they keep being the best. Borders are reasonable. How about that? There are a lot of countries in the world that are not governed well. The vast majority of them, right? And they've been not governed well forever. And to me, that means that there's something wrong with the values that are held collectively by the people who've established those polities. It is more noble to teach young people about responsibilities than about rights. That's a good conservative message. Radical change should be viewed with suspicion, particularly in a time of radical change. And the rules aren't there to oppress. They're there to keep us away from each other's throats because human beings are very warlike and we're very competitive and we're very aggressive. And if we are fortunate enough to have woven together a social fabric that basically renders us peaceful and cooperative, we should try disrupting that at our great peril. So how do we judge our political system? Well, we don't judge it by the dreamlike, ill-informed, ideologically motivated, pathological utopias of the radical left. One of the great advantages to conservative philosophy is that it's humble. It's humble from, uh, from the perspective of social experimentation. Look, I got to say, I'm not making a case for conservatism. I'm not here to make a political case. Right? I'm here to make a philosophical and psychological case. And I think that's what I've been doing all along. It has political implications. So I'm not saying that you should be conservative or that conservative is the only way to be. Because I actually don't believe that for, for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is that I know that political belief is determined in large part by temperament and personality. And that's very strongly biologically influenced. And so conservatives tend to be lower in openness, which is a trait associated with creativity, and higher in conscientiousness, which is a trait associated with industriousness and orderliness. They tend to make good managers and administrators and lawyers. They tend to make good conservative business types. That's, that's their forte. That's their niche. And that's a valid place to be and a valid thing to be. And, you know, Conservatives aren't so good at being entrepreneurial, and they're not so good at being artistic and creative. That's not their niche. That's more the niche of the liberal end of the spectrum. And as far as I'm concerned, for the political system to function properly, you need proper representation for all the temperamental types, and they need to be engaged in dialogue. So, but the thing is, is that when the conservatives are saying, well, you know, especially when they're perhaps thinking about leading the damn party, let's say, that they're worried about speaking their mind in a conservative manner, that's just not a good thing. That means that something's gone wrong with our political system and seriously wrong. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, I did this lecture in Vancouver called a left-wing case for free speech because you can actually make a left-wing case for free speech pretty easily, right? It's like Obviously, some people have more influence and authority than others, and just as obviously, it's harder for the people with less influence and authority to make their case known, so clearly they need to be able to make their case. So that's the left-wing case for free speech. It's fairly straightforward. I thought it needed to be made because, especially on the radical left, people seem to have forgotten that free speech was actually their most, what, welcome friend, and, and enabled them to do whatever good things they did manage to do over the last hundred years, but I made a left-wing case, and so that was easy and reasonably entertaining, and you can watch that on YouTube if you want. And so tonight what I thought I'd do, as a counterpart to that, is lay out what I believe might be some tenets for a viable 21st century conservatism. And these are ideas that I'm playing with, so I'm gonna, I wrote down about 12 of them. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but we can, we can start with a few, and this is, what the conservatives could be selling to the public. These things have become, what would you say? People are afraid to say them. Here's the first one. The fundamental assumptions of Western civilization are valid. How about that? You know, it's not... You think it's an accident? Oh, here's how you find out, okay? Which countries do people want to move away from? Hey, not ours. Which countries do people want to move to? Ours. Guess what? They work better. And it's not because we went around the world stealing everything we could get our hands on. It's because we got certain fundamental assumptions right 
Thank God for that. After thousands and thousands of years of trying, and because of that, we've managed to establish a set of civilizations that are shining lights in the world. You know, now, you can be pretty damn filthy and still be a shining light in this world, right? Because if you look around the world at the state of governance in most places, it's like the most pathological, corrupt, and vicious thugs rule. And to stand out as an illuminated light against that background isn't so difficult. But nonetheless, you know, we're as good as it's got. And unless we can come up with something better, we should be very careful about messing around with that. So why don't we start with the assumption that we're doing something right. One of the things we're doing right, for example, is that we actually value the individual, right? The individual has intrinsic value in Western societies. Do you know how long it took people to formulate that as an idea? And how unlikely that idea is that poor you, you know, useless, powerless you, with all your damn faults, you're actually worth something. You're worth something to the point that the law has to respect you. God, we don't want to abandon that for some half-witted collectivism, which we're doing as rapidly as possible, because one of the things that characterizes the radical left types is they don't give a damn about you as an individual or about individuals at all. You're black or you're white or you're Latino or you're transsexual or you're homosexual or whatever. You're a group. You're a member of a group. And the only thing that matters is the group. Well, I can tell you, if the only thing that matters is the group, you bloody well don't matter very much. And then you've got to ask yourself just exactly what sort of people are trying to set things up so it is that the individual doesn't matter very much. Well, it's the sort of people to whom the individual doesn't matter very much. Peaceful social being is preferable to isolation and to war. In consequence, it justly and rightly demands some sacrifice of individual impulse and idiosyncrasy. Okay, so, you want to live alone in the bush? You're going to starve to death and be eaten by black flies. It's not a good solution. Okay, so you have to cooperate with other people, and that means you can't get to be your whimsical self 100% of the time. It means that most of you has to be sacrificed so that you can be approximately like everyone else. Now, that's a real sacrifice, right? It's, it's a sacrifice of... Of, it might even be a sacrifice of some of the unique qualities that everyone needs from you. Socialization costs, but the advantage of it is, well, we get to exist. Look, we can all sit together in this hall, and no one has their hands around each other's throats. And we're talking about serious things. Okay, man, that's worth something. And what it's worth in part is, you don't get to be whatever spectacularly colored creature you want to be all the time. You have to do what you can to be normal and predictable. And it's not like normal and predictable is the highest virtue, because it's not. And, and being more than normal and being, and being unique and creative and contributing in that way is extraordinarily important. But the fundamental point is, is that social being requires the sacrifice of a certain amount of individual idiosyncrasy. And that's a fundamentally conservative claim. It's like, you should, be, you should do what everyone else does, unless you have a really good reason to vary. It's a good rule. It's like, you do what people have done throughout time. You grow up, you find a partner, you establish a stable relationship, you get a job, you make yourself useful, you have some children, you do something productive and interesting with your spare time, and you try to act like a respectable human being. That's what you do. That's a conservative ethos. And if, you're, if you have something spectacular about you that needs to be revealed to the world, then break some rules, man. Go right ahead. I'm dead serious about that, but most of the time you don't. And even if you happen to be a special person, and you might be, 90% of you still isn't special. So most of the time you're still going to be following the rules. And the rules aren't there to oppress. They're there to keep us, at, they're there to keep us away from each other's throats. Because human beings are very warlike, and we're very competitive, and we're very aggressive. And if we are fortunate enough to have woven together a social fabric that basically renders us peaceful and cooperative, we should try disrupting that at our great peril. Because the general rule for human existence throughout the centuries has been turmoil and war. And we don't have that here. And so thank God for that. And it's worth a bit of a sacrifice. Next, equality. Equity, equity, that's worse, right? Equity means 
Equality of outcome, it means that every single organization has 50% women and 50% men. Doesn't matter whether the men and women differ in their intrinsic preferences, which, by the way, they do. The scientific literature on that is completely clear. It was established by the early 90s. It was established in the Scandinavian countries, where they've done most to flatten out the socioeconomic differential, say, between men and women. Didn't get rid of the differences between men and women. In fact, they became exaggerated. The biggest personality differences in the world between men and women are in Scandinavia, just as the biggest differences in interest between men and women are in Scandinavia. Because when you get rid of the socio-cultural differences between men and women, the biological differences don't disappear, they maximize. How else could it be? And as I said, the literature on that is clear, and the way that the postmodernist radicals react to that is by criticizing the scientific method itself on their computers, which only work, of course, because the scientific method actually works, you hear the egalitarian clarion call everywhere. Everything should be equal. Everything should be equally distributed. We should strive for equity. It's like, wrong. Especially if you're a conservative. Wrong. What we want are just hierarchies of competence. Not everyone's a neurosurgeon. You know, if your father has a brain tumor, you probably want a hierarchy of competence for neurosurgeons so you can pick the one that's the best so that he might not die. That's what a hierarchy of competence is for. For the postmodernists, there's no hierarchy that isn't based on power. Well, because they think the world runs on power. And that's why they're willing to use power to get what they want, because it's the only thing they believe in. But a valid hierarchy of competence, it's, God, we need those things, man. We need the best plumbers. We need the best contractors. We need the best, we need, we need the best carpenters. We need the best lecturers. There has to be a, a hierarchy of quality, and not only so that we know who the best are and can reward them properly, but so that we can reward them so they keep being the best. It's like, you know, if, if you have a great educator, if you have a great leader, if you, if you have a great thinker, you want to reward them so they keep thinking and they keep educating so they can tell you something. It's not a reward for their intrinsic being. It's a calculated move on your part to suck everything out of them that's valuable as fast as you can. That's what a hierarchy of competence is for. And the idea that hierarchies of competence don't exist is it's so cynical. It's such a pathologically cynical idea. And it's actually quite patently untrue because here's an interesting tidbit from the psychological literature. Let's say you want to determine what the best predictors are for lifetime success in a Western society. Well, what would you hope for? How about intelligence? There would be a good one. Let's hope the smart people occupy more positions of complexity. Right? Because they're smarter. Would you want it any other way? Okay, and then so, and that's great. The number one predictor of accomplishment in Western societies is intelligence. So that means the system works. What's the number two predictor? Conscientiousness. Well, what's that? It's a trait marker for hard work. So who, who gets ahead? Smart people who work hard. Now, that doesn't account for every bit of the difference between people in terms of their hierarchical structure because hierarchies aren't perfect, they're corrupt. People get to the top sometimes because they're psychopathic, although, believe me, a hell of a lot less than you think. Because a psychopath has to keep moving from place to place because once he reveals himself as deceitful and untrustworthy, he has to go find new suckers to fleece. So the idea that, you know, there's no distinction between a CEO and a psychopath, it's like, that's only made by someone who A, knows nothing about psychopaths, B, knows nothing about CEOs, and C, has something fundamental against the entire capitalist structure. Because it's simply not true. Corrupt, sometimes. Greedy, sometimes. Short-sighted, sometimes running companies that are doing their best to auger themselves into the ground, and so, you know, it's bad people running a dying organization. But generally speaking, it's not the case. Our hierarchies of competence are reasonably functional. And not only are they functional, they're valuable. We need to know who the competent people are, and we need to reward them. And even more importantly, we need to tell young people, hey, there's some hierarchies of competence out there. Like, a thousand of them. Go be a plumber, man, but be a good one, you know? Be an honest one, you know? And so you can be a tradesman, and you can, be, you can make a lot of money as a tradesperson. It's a bloody, reliable, honorable, uh, forthright, productive way of making a living. And there is a hell of a lot of difference between a working man who knows what he's doing and one who doesn't. 
both in terms of skill and ethics, right? And you work with someone who knows what they're doing, it's a bloody pleasure. They tell you what they're going to do, they tell you how much it will cost, they go and do it, it works, and you pay them. Perfect. Everyone's happy. And that's what happens when you have genuine hierarchies of competence. And so you, you listen to these panderers of egalitarianism, egalitarianism and equity, and they fail to recognize completely that there are differences in rank between people. It's not such a terrible thing, man. Maybe you wouldn't be a great lawyer. Like, it's certainly possible. Most people aren't. But that doesn't mean there isn't something you could be great at. There's lots of hierarchies to attempt to climb, and if you fail in one, go try in another. But the point is, you're still trying to aim for the top, and what the hell are you going to do if you don't try to aim for the top? You know, flap about uselessly and whine about your life? It's not helpful. It'll just make you miserable. You're not reliable to anyone. You can't help out in a crisis. It's like, so you tell young people, and this is another message for conservatives, like, I don't care what you're going to do, but go out there and make something of yourself for God's sake. Be an honest person and work and get to the top of whatever it is that you want to get to the top of. You know, and, 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 and stand up for yourself like a respectable human being and be a bit of a light on the world instead of a blight. You know, and you can tell young people that and they haven't been told that by anyone now. And so the young men are so hungry for that that it's, it's painful to watch. They're so relieved when fi someone finally comes up and says, hey, you know, you, you get your act together a bit, discipline yourself, see if you can learn to tell the truth, concentrate on something for a year or two, you could be a bloody world beater. They think, really? That's possible? Wow, that would be, that would be interesting. That might make life, life worth living. It's like, yeah, it might. So why don't you go do it? All right, next. Borders are reasonable. How about that? The law is the border that stops someone from stealing your laptop. And if it's an Apple laptop, well, it's the sort of laptop that a social justice warrior would carry. And then the social justice warrior is going to be very irritated if you happen to purloin their laptop. And then you might point out to them, you know, it's a border that protects you from having that thing taken. And they say, well, the border should be open. It's okay, man, no problem. You hand over that laptop right now. And everything else you own, too. If you don't like borders, and you can get rid of the damn walls in your house, and you don't need doors on your bedroom either, and we can keep an eye on you whenever we want. And so much for borders. One of the things that really differs between liberals and conservatives, between the left and the right, is the right, is in, the right likes tight borders between things. It's part of being conscientious at every level, conceptually, sexually, familially, provincially, nationally. The right says, look, let's keep, let's keep the borders between things pretty distinct. And the left says, yeah, maybe not because some of those borders are in the wrong place and a little bit more free flow of information wouldn't be a bad thing. And the thing is, they're right, but so are the conservatives. And that's why you have to talk. It's like, well, we've got some borders. That's a good thing. Maybe some of them need to be moved around a little bit, and that's what the political dialogue is for. But that doesn't mean that borders themselves are a bad idea. They're a great idea, because without borders, everything mashes into the same untenable state of undifferentiated chaos, and you can't live in that. And so the people who are trying to tear down the borders conceptually, politically, and practically, what they want is the chaos that that would bring. They either want that or they're too foolish to know that their pursuits will produce that. So let's, let's, let's be a little bit clear that if you stand up and say, yeah, borders, they're okay. They've got their problems, but they're okay. That doesn't make you a, a, a bigot beyond redemption. It just makes you someone with some sense. And it's actually okay to be someone with some sense. Limits on immigration are also reasonable. Well, we need to figure out what those limits are. And that's what the bloody political dialogue is for. But the fact that it should be limited to some degree is also reasonable. Otherwise, why not just open the borders and let everybody come in? Well, the reason you don't do that is because a complex system cannot tolerate extensive transformation over too short a period of time. Now, you want immigrants to come in, especially if they're the sorts of immigrants who are likely to contribute properly to the success of your polity. And lots of immigrants do that. I mean, I think the vast majority, for example, of entrepreneurs in the United States come from the Indian subcontinent. So great, you know, bring them over. They're highly educated. They're extraordinarily productive. They make lots of new businesses. And then they pump money like, back, like mad back in India. Good deal. But that doesn't mean that we have a our arms are open to everyone immigration policy because it's complete rubbish. All that means is you're not thinking about it. So, and here's a coda to that for conservatives. Here's something. 
I've been thinking about this a lot lately. It should not be assumed that citizens of societies that have not evolved functional individual rights predicated polities will hold values in keeping with such polities. So we could say, look, there are a lot of countries in the world that are not governed well, the vast majority of them, right? And they've been not governed well forever. And to me, that means that there's something wrong with the values that are held collectively by the people who've established those polities. Well, you shouldn't be naive and assume that merely because you move them to a new country, they're going to let their innate democratic longings flourish. It doesn't work that way. So if you stand up and say, look, you know, let's be a little cautious. Let's make sure that we don't transform our society so rapidly that we lose what we have. Let's be careful about that. That doesn't mean that you're a morally reprehensible demon. It just means that you're conservative and it's a reasonable position to hold. So there's no sense in apologizing to it for it. Now that doesn't mean you get to like hide your bigotry under a mask of moral virtue, you know. The discrimination issue is quite clear as far as I'm concerned, so that's associated with bigotry. If you have two people who are applying for a job, you should pick the one that's most qualified and not pay any attention to any of the other attributes of the person that have nothing to do with the job. People should be paid so that they are able and willing to perform socially useful and desirable duties. Okay, so the radical leftists, they, they react to me this way. They say, well, you hold a position of privilege and power. And I think, first, you don't know a goddamn thing about me, and you have no idea how I got to my position of privilege and power. And it was no birthright, I can tell you that. I was a small, like, thick-glassed, intellectual, non- what do you call that? Athletic child. You know, I was a year younger than my peers. I suffered plenty of, what would you say? trouble for my loud mouth and my intellect when I was growing up, you know? I had my struggles. I'm not complaining about it. The point is, is that you can't attribute privilege to a class of people, you know? And you can't attribute power to people who happen to occupy a position of competence and authority either. There's some possibility that they occupy that because they worked hard and were fortunate, let's not forget about that, and had some good social support and didn't have some horrible disease, thank God. But you can't just make the case that the position is there as a reward. It's not there as, as a reward at all. It's there as a consequence of the person offering something valuable to those who want to pay for it. And the reason you pay for them isn't to reward them. It isn't so that you give them a pat on the back and say, well, you're a good person and, you know, you deserve this position. It's because you're saying to them, produce. We find what you're producing of value. And so we're going to give you what you need in order to be motivated to keep doing it. But it's not because we like you. It's not because we, re we respect your rights. It has nothing to do with equity. It's we're trying to get every goddamn thing we can from you as fast as possible. And we're going to pay you to do it. And so people deserve their damn pay. And the reason they deserve it isn't because it's a reward. It's because that's how you get productive people to do things that are difficult and time-consuming and that perhaps they wouldn't do on their own accord to continue doing them so you can benefit. Citizens have the inalienable right to benefit from the results of their own honest labor. That's a good one. Yes, that's a conservative truism, you know, why? Well, it isn't because, you, because you're good-hearted and you want them to have money. It's because they'll work if you let them benefit from the work and you want them to work because if they work, then they do things that you need. It's as simple as that. It's self-interest and it's the right kind of self-interest. So if you work hard, it's like, great, have your money. It is more noble to teach young people about responsibilities than about rights. That's a good conservative message. It's like you have a son, you know, or you have a daughter, and you say, bloody well, grow up, stand on your own two feet, make something of yourself, right? So that I can be proud of you when you come over. And so that maybe you're useful in a crisis. It's like, pick up your damn load and, and, and shoulder it and do something useful and, and forget about your damn rights for a while. You can think about what it is that you should be doing to benefit yourself and your family and society. And you'll find some purpose in your life because of that. And so, well, that's a counterposition to the perpetrators of the endless rights buffet, right? Well, as long as we give you enough rights, you're going to be what? Free? You're going to be happy? It's like, yeah, sure. You'll drown in the sea of chaos. And that's what's happening to people now, too.
Here's another one. Radical change should be viewed with suspicion, particularly in a time of radical change. Okay, there's never been a time in the history of the world where things are changing as fast as they are now. And not only are they changing fast, the rate at which they're changing is increasing. Like, we're moving fast forward at such a rate that it's unbelievable. You can't even keep up. I don't care what discipline you're in. It's like it's not so bad to have some people putting their feet in the ground, they're digging their heels in and say, look, we got a lot to swallow already. We got a lot to chew on and digest. Let's not muck about with everything that's worked so far. What has worked? It's not such a bad idea for people to have long-term families, right? We could say, let's try to support the family. We could even say, let's try to support the traditional family. Why? Well, maybe boys and girls need role models of each sex. I know that's a terrible thing to say, but it is possible. It's certainly the case, too, that intact two-parent families have children that thrive more than broken families. And broken families are a catastrophe for everyone. Now, you might say, well, I shouldn't stay with someone that I don't get along with. And it's like, yeah, yeah, fair enough, except that there's no one that you're ever going to find to stay with that you're going to get along with all of the time, especially in your shoddy condition. And so you're lucky that anybody will, you're lucky that anybody will put up with you for a week, much less your whole life. It's like the, the point of marriage is to tough it out. And you don't tough it out for your happiness. That's not what you're in there for. You tough it out so that you have someone to tie the rope of your life together with it, you have a chance to tie the rope of your life together with the rope of someone else's life and to make it strong and to make a place that children can have some security and some encouragement and thereby contribute to the future and pay for the miracle of your birth and your own raising. That's why you get married. And there's no reason that conservatives can't stand up and say, look, we're willing to tolerate alternative family arrangements. But when you start making the claim that the traditional family unit is just another construct and that it's not something fundamental to our polity, it's like that's you've taken your damn argument too far. First of all, you have no evidence whatsoever for that claim. And there's plenty of counter evidence. Here's another one. The government, local and distant, should leave people to their own devices as much as possible. Why? Well, part of it's just humility. It's like, I'd rather that there was a million of you out there making your own stupid mistakes so that maybe a thousand of you can get it right than for one of you to impose their view on everyone and risk getting it catastrophically wrong for everyone at the same time. And that's really the alternative. Like, if you're a social scientist, like, I mean an actual scientist, I don't mean a bloody ideologue, one of the things that you learn very rapidly is, you know, you do a simple experiment, you think you're going to predict some element of human behavior. So here's my hypothesis. I'm going to put people in this experimental situation, and this is what they're going to do. And then you run the experiment, and they don't do that. They do something completely different. You find out that even though what you have them do is really simple, you don't have a clue what they're up to. And that's just a tiny little controlled experiment about one little tiny thing, and you're wrong. It's like one of the great advantages to conservative philosophy is that it's humble. It's humble from, uh, from the perspective of social experimentation. It's, like, it's not like everything's great and we should just continue going the way we're going. It's like, well, everything isn't as broken as it might be, and I'm kind of stupid and blind, and all I have is a bat, and probably hitting it isn't going to make it any better. All I'll do is shatter it. And so the conservative says, it's working. Be quiet. <laughs> Sneak away. Maybe it'll keep, keep working. And that's a perfectly reasonable perspective. Now, obviously, sometimes things have to change. But the conservative can come up and say, don't be thinking that you have so much evidence that what you're doing is right. Or that it will have the outcome that you expected. Okay, and this is what I would close with for the conservatives. This is a nice one. I really like this. We hear a lot about the sins of the West. And they're manifold. Because people are corrupt and our societies are corrupt. But you have to think about it in terms of relative corruption rather than absolute corruption. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> your family is not perfect. But there are worse families. Compared to the perfect family, your family isn't looking so good. But compared to other families, maybe it's not looking so bad at all. Okay, so how do we judge our political system? Well, we don't judge it by the dreamlike, ill-informed, ideologically motivated, pathological utopias of the radical left or the radical right for that matter. We saw what happened in the 20th century when you do that. That is a very, very bad idea. 
And you know, there were tens of millions of people that died in the 20th century demonstrating just how bad an idea was, that was. And you'd think we would have learned that, but we didn't. What you do instead is you take a look at your country and you think, okay, how is it doing compared to other countries? Other actual real countries. And maybe you look at a variety of different indicators, because that's what you do if you're careful. And if it happens to be hovering up near the top, then you think, well, might be just the grace of God, might be just good fortune, but it is possible that we've got something right, and that we shouldn't muck around with it too much, and that we should have some gratitude for it instead of assuming that the proper comparison is whatever heaven that you happen to be able to dream up that you would love to impose on other people without their cooperation and without their will. And that's what the bloody social utopians are selling us. And they're doing everything they can to implement and institute that as rapidly as possible. It's like, enough of that. We've had enough of that.